Hello, my name is Dana, and today I'm going to talk about identifying novel biological pathways through phylogenetic profiling based network analysis. I'll start with an introduction. We only know about 20% of genes to be associated with phenotypes in M. omim, and only 50% of genes are annotated to pathways, for example, in biological pathways in Go. And these genes, we don't know what they're doing, and we also don't know which pathways they belong to. So there may, may be many biological pathways that we don't know about. And the aim of this work is to identify these novel biological pathways using phylogenetic profiling. So how do you do that? How to identify new biological pathways? It's very hard to characterize them because actually you don't know what you're asking. But recently, novel biological pathways have actually been identified. And these are some examples. There are many more. So we believe that there is, it, it's possible. So how do you do that? How do you look for new biological pathways? So we start with, an, with a phylogenetic profiling matrix, which includes genes and species divided into clades. And I'm going to elaborate about this in a minute. The next stage is to optimize the distance matrix, uh, deal with power logs, deal with uh, integration of the clades into a single information, building the coevolved network, and identify communities within the algorithm, using an algorithm, sorry, and then data integration to find new pathways. So A, B, and C have the same profiles because they are in the same pathway. And so they have the same evolutionary pressures on them. And then we can look for other genes in the same pathway. For example, gene X has the same profile. And many works before showed that, indeed, genes with that have the same profiles are working together. So the first stage was to optimize the NPP matrix, as I said. So we are using the normalized phylogenetic profiling matrix, which is a continuous measure of orthology, and we use two normalization stages. The first is per protein normalization to, to normalize for the length of the, of the protein, which affects the bit score. And, this, and then we get the LPP length normalized phylogenetic profiling, which I'll use later. And then we use the per species normalization, which actually does set scoring. And the idea is to, to ask a certain protein is conserved more than expected or less than expected in a specific species because obviously 50% conservation in yeast is very high conservation while in gorilla it's very low conservation. So we did a lot of iterations on the normalization of the matrix which I'm not going to elaborate on right now but you're welcome to ask me later. The next uh, the next subject we were dealing with is power logs. Power logs show very strong coevolution signal in all clades and mask other interactions. So here you see an example of the tubulinum, tubulins. These are genes, these are species, and these, they are organized from human to the more distant species. And you see that they all have, each column is a species, and you see that they have very similar uh, phylogenetic profile. And this is not surprising because they have very similar um, sequence similarity. So indeed, they are working together, but we don't need phylogenetic profiling to identify sequence similarity. So this information is not relevant to us. So what we did is use paralogous, paralogous groups as single nodes in the network, which means we took all the genes that, that act similarly, which means both in terms of the BLAST uh, E value and in the correlation in NPP. <clears throat> what you see here is pairs of genes. And we defined all these genes as, um, all these gene pairs as parts of a network of power logs. And then we used inform map algorithms to, to, to identify communities of power logs. And, the, and these we call power groups. And we use them as edges in the network. The next issue we we dealt with is, is uh, integrating different information from different clades. 
we showed in many works before and we and others that clades give very different information in phylogenetic profiling. You see here, for example, these are all pathways. Every, every row is a pathway, and every column is a um, clade. So you see here eukaryota, chordata, mammalia, etc. And the color is how strongly um, the clade recapitulates the pathway. So you see that the darker the color, the more, more connections within the pathway that are identified. And the black point shows which is the clade that gives the highest, the strongest signal. So you see that for different pathways, different clades give strong, give strong signal, and we can't uh, predict which clade will be used, will be best for each pathway. So um, we want to integrate the data from different clades. So how do we choose which clades to use? For, for, so first of all, we need coverage, which means we want to cover all the information, all the clades we have, all the species we have. And the, um, the other considerations are the size of a cluster. We don't want two, two large clusters, and obviously two small clusters are not informative. And we, we ask the question of overlap. For example, eukaryota, chordata, and amalia obviously overlap, but they give very different results. As you see here, different pathways give are identified differently within these clades. So overlap is not necessarily bad. So what we did is we took one million top pairs, top correlating gene pairs in each clade, and we asked how do they behave in different clades. For example, here you have fungi in the two subclades, Pasigia micota and Ascomicota. <clears throat> and you see here, for example, that Ascomicota and Pasigia micota give, give very different um, information. For example, you see that it, all these genes that give high correlation in Ascomicota give actually very poor correlation in Pasigia micota. On the other hand, Ascomicota and fungi give very similar results. So they give the same information, so we don't need both of them. We don't need redundancy. So accordingly to this kind of analysis, we chose these clades to work with. And then we moved on to build the coevolution gene network. So how to integrate edges from different clades? We now have a network, a complete network, um, with um, information from different clades, and you want to integrate them into a single into a signal edge. So we looked at a lot of ways, and the way we chose was weight of was sum of sigmoids. And the idea is to amplify strong signals because, as I showed you before, there are some clades where which give much stronger signals than others in clades that in um, specific pathways. And we want this information. So even if the signal is in very in very few clades, we still want to see it. So that's why we use sigmoid to strengthen strong signals. So uh, we didn't want to use we didn't want to use a complete network. Obviously, we we wanted a sparse network. So we needed to to choose a cutoff. So, so this is the distribution of the um, of the weights of the analysis of the sum of sigmoids, as I showed you before. And as you can see here, there's a big drop in, at, uh, at the weight of one and, a bigger, and another drop at the weight of two. So we are interested in these very strong key signals, the long tail that we have here. The next stage was to use communities, communities detection, and we used multiple clustering methods. And the question that arose was how to compare different clustering methods. So we compared cluster size. For example, some um, algorithms gave us a division of half of the genes into a single cluster. So this is obviously not informative. So the cluster size, the number of clusters, and F1, which incorporates both recall and precision, is, a, is to show how well do we recapitulate known pathways. So finally, we decided on the task algorithm from the GIMP challenge as the best clustering method. So now we have clusters, which we assume um, can correspond to biological pathways. So let's review what we did. 
We started with optimizing the NPP matrix. We moved on to optimize the distance matrix and then to creation of the different clades into a single information. We dealt with power logs. We constructed the coevolution network. We identified communities. And now we're at the stage of data integration. So we use protein protein interactions and co expression and obviously coevolution to find new patterns. So, data integration. What we're currently using is the human protein atlas for RNA and protein, and different species such as worm base for the nematode and uh, MGI for the mouse phenotypes. And we also want to incorporate protein-protein interactions, for example, from string on biogroup. So here are some examples of networks we identified. So we were very happy to find some known pathways in the clusters we found, which gives validation to our work. So the first, the first pathway we found is the TCA pathway, which is known to be highly co-evolved. So here you see the LPP, which you're already familiar, familiar with. You see that the information comes from Apicomplexo, which is, not, uh, which is expected as these, these are parasites. And you see that these genes in string are very highly connected, very well connected. And also this is the co-evolution, this is our network. And you see the genes are really highly connected. And here you see which of the clades give the strong signal. And you see here the active complexa. Another pathway which is known to be co-evolved is molybdenum pathway. And you see here again the signal is very strong, specifically in Ascomicota. Um, you see the genes in string are connect, uh, well connected and also in our cluster. And you see that these are the um, these are the two clades give that give the strong uh, signal. The third I want to show you is the oxidation reduction, which actually is very strong in nematodes. And again, the string collaborates with our results um, about the connection between the genes. And here is for the most important part, which is the examples of new clusters. I should say we don't have right now biological validation, but uh, we hope to, to do that soon. So this cluster, the pathway is actually known because there are a lot of genes here that are connected to DNA repair. For those of you who know these genes, for example, MR11, RAD17, POT1. Um, so some of these genes are already known to be connected, but some genes are not connected. For example, this gene, which is uncharacterized. Uh, in our clusters, these are, this is a fairly highly connected, uh, interconnected um, cl uh, cluster. So we are very interested to characterize this gene as a new DNA repair gene. Um, we show that uh, in normal tissue, the um, pure protein um, is co-expressed, and also in RNA. And you see the very nice coevolution here. Another cluster we had shares three genes that are not characterized, is not connected at all in string, although it's very highly connected in our uh, network. And you see a very nice signal here in the LPP. So we are very interested to know what this pathway is and what it is doing. Here is a cluster which shows a lot of genes from the ER, which are marked here in red. And there are two genes that are uncharacterized and some genes that are known to be connected to the in the plasma reticulum, and this is the cluster, and you see the strong signal in both Aves and Actinoptery and um, Mikrodata. And finally, here is another cluster. You see the genes that are not connected in the string, however, they are they are co-expressed. They show very similar. Um, phenotypes in mouse and in nematode. They show a nice coevolution signal in both actinoptery and apicoplexa. And we are really interested in um, validating these in biological system, in a biological um, way. So we are searching for new pathways and we want to do biological validation. Thanks for listening and I'll be happy to answer any questions.